just to introduce a little bit the um, next session. We have a group of very capable, um, a group of 13 students here who have joined us in Prato. Um, and they started with a bit of a whirlwind tour, a little bit um, blindly following us around to these funny sites of um, industrial reuse of various kinds. Um, and that might be from typical um, sort of abandoned sites to new renewal sites to exhibition sites and so on. Landed in Prato, had a first week of visiting a number of places, manufacturer at the Baki, um, amongst others, and had to um, very quickly kind of orient themselves in Prato, looking at a couple of areas um, in Macrolotto Zero and Fabricone um, and Fabricino as two sort of uh, sites to help anchor their investigations. So what they've been asked to do along the way is take a whole range of sort of samples of the city through video, sound and sketching, um, that they were sort of tests in a way to come and land in Prato and potentially replicate or translate some of the things that they had very um, rapidly, I think, absorbed. So they've made some videos um, understanding or sort of, um, let's say, communicating what their um, experiences and investigations have been. Um, which they're going to show and then um, use in a way as a provocation to ask the audience some questions about what, where they've come to and what they've arrived at as a way of a, a type of a continuing dialogue. So it'd be a great one to um, have a little bit of generosity from the room, understanding that um, they have been through a, a little bit of disruption over the last few days um, and so have done an incredible job to get up today. Um, but also that in some senses, it's potentially not so much about the, the video in and of itself, but perhaps the, some, some of the ideas, I think, that the, the students have been engaging with um, and where they might take those in, in, future, in future conversations for, for both themselves and, and for us, potentially. So I might um, invite them to all come up um, and switch over to their... Um, so our video, along with Tayana, who's not here today, um, our video examines Macrolotta Zero through a lens of private versus public um, and reveals our observations and experiences within the area um, and interrogates them on a tectonic, on a tectonic um, scale. Yeah. Well, it's not entirely comfortable. Outside of the main street, the footpaths are pretty narrow and in need of repair despite the heavy traffic with people and vehicles. Maybe it's due to the industrial history of the space. We're currently navigating an area built for work with the facade of a township. I think it's really only when you reach the main road where there's evidence of the public realm. There's updated wider footpaths and bench seating and rain gardens. It creates a really interesting threshold between the footpath and the shops which line the street. And it indicates plans for future development, I think. I think there is a typology, but whether it's considered, I'm not really sure. We're next to these townhouses here, where we can see varying scales of retail and commercial spaces and residential above on a smaller footprint. But walk 50 metres in any direction off the main road, and it's an amalgamation of warehouses, factories and post-war housing stock. Well, it seems like as the industry grew out of the space, the availability of land was very important. It couldn't be squandered on public amenity. Now that the program of the area is shifting, we can see the lack of communal space, well, at least in the traditional sense. The garden. It's such an interesting dichotomy to the rest of the street. 
you're walking through an area that's almost entirely privatized and then you're here with this large beautiful open green space but it's all hidden behind this giant fence you've got to peer through the gate and i can't help but feel like what if it was all open I mean, I don't live here, so I can't speak for the community, but I don't think it's a coincidence that in the past you had these large multi-residential apartments right across the street from what were once factories and warehouses. A closeness to work is often a utility people value. It's good to see how some of these spaces are being redefined from their heritage as private spaces towards community value. Yeah, I think it's this concept of admission, both physically and visually. I'm usually unsure of what spaces I have access to, especially ones that I have to peek into just to get a glimpse at. It's due to a combination of materiality and architectural design of the buildings we're walking past, and it really compounds this notion of what is public and what is private. I mean, yeah, of course. The idea of a generated space is to accommodate the human body. And our needs change not only day to day, but generation to generation. Take Auto Zero, for example. It's literally just down the road. It may not be a perfect integration of public and private, but it, just like the factory that's now being used as a classroom around the corner, follows a notion of using the persistent fabric and opening it up for repurpose. It's a strong concept and an exciting one that we see happening around us every day. Which side? Um, our film looks to key precedents of economic, manufacturing and value innovations within Greater Prato. Through understanding each system, these processes begin to overlap and speak in dialogue with each other.
Designs, art, brand, commercial projects, cultural projects, it's very mixed. Here you are in a space uh, that takes care of textiles on uh, the same time at 360 degrees. So, on a whole spectrum of activity and a whole range of possibilities. We work with designs, art, brand, commercial projects, cultural projects, it's very mixed. Our video explores the macro-micro strategies of presidents observed throughout Italy, speculating how these could be activated on a temporary, regular and permanent basis on our chosen side of Fabricone Prato, acknowledging the past and then can be used on multiple sites on a global scale.
Well done, everybody. I think you have done some considerable work in the last few days, so you should all be very proud of yourselves. Um, so I think that we've got a little bit of time now just for the students to maybe ask a question or two, um, and um, we'll keep moving on. Um, but I think that would anyone like to kick us off and perhaps ask people why we've got some brains in the room about what they've learned or where they want to take it or so forth? More of a commentary. Oh, there we go. Sorry, we don't really expect.
Uh, oh my God. The second uh, video, because um, I appreciate the fact that in order to give uh, the answer about um, how to transform or how to the spaces, we have to understand what there is behind in terms of uh, economic uh, relationships, in terms of uh, uh, other spaces involved. Uh, so enlarge our, uh, uh, not only point of view, but our glance and uh, in observing many different things. And I think that this is something, this is what something um, architects uh, lack. <laughs> Because uh, they uh, they think that it, okay, I'm it's an exaggeration, but it's space. It's important, but you cannot uh, transform or understand spaces just looking only at spaces. So I think that uh, what you have uh, the, the possible answer, a tentative answer would be try to understand context, uh, the society, the, the people living there. And uh, um, uh, this is just to, to take into account uh, what, uh, no, uh, uh, what are the needs uh, on, on the ground. Uh, the, the problem is then uh, when, you, when we think only about the, the, the shape of or uh, the, the uh, qua the architectural quality of space uh, just arriving top down uh, sometimes uh, uh, the possibility of the people to no? say something uh, it, thanks to you because you probably you hear you was listening to my suggestion to put the music and sounds and people living there, so to make more animated uh, your video. Sorry for my... And um, to answer questions, there are uh, two things, uh, and I believe uh, with the second video was qu quite clear. The things you can interrogate as a place, uh, looking from environmental point of view. So if you make uh, really good analysis and deep analysis with uh, geophysics uh, and geologists and botanical and biologists, you can recognize the story of the landscape of the place because there is not only the story and the memory of the people, but there is, there is the memory of the place. Because here for sure, before that Prato became so industrial places, the landscape was completely different and you can make an analysis if having the skill and the attitude to do a thing like that, uh, or calling an expert to help you, you can rebuild the process uh, of the history of the landscape, as well the memory of the place uh, by the people. The thing is that here in Prato, there is a superposition of layers of culture, because uh, of course, in all the, 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 the cities nowadays, no? because there is a multicultural, no? so there is a superposition as well. And what you can do, what I, I think you must do, <laughs> like architect, is to go to work with the people, to ask to the people because they have a, a huge uh, you know, um, cultural background that they can share to you. You can have a lot of you really, you can have a wonderful, uh, good end, but you are not artists, you are architects. So the civic dimension of your practice is fundamental. It's the differentiation between artists and us, because the artists, they make art because they try to follow their inquietudes, Maria Lai says, no, told to us. And Richard Serra as well, I remember I made a question to him in Punta Lado, waiting for Punta La Dogana that was like shocked, you know. They think that the people like a part of the art, you know, but they are not interested about the people. They are interested about what they are looking for. And of course we are, then they are open door to us, no? Like uh, never. <laughs> uh, so they are really important. But the architect is uh, the, the, the civic dimension of our practice is fundamental. We are here to ameliorate the condition of the people. And let me say, I, like landscape architect of the environment the humans and the modern humans that are fundamental. Just uh, 
I think that then, um, when I say that we have to enlarge uh, our glands, I don't want to say that we have to know and, and everything. We have uh, we have to become able to 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 talk with different not only people but also expertise and being able to put the right questions in order to understand uh, what we need uh, because otherwise there is the risk to to stay on the surface. Point. because we are only working more on easier sorry <laughs> that's very loud <laughs> um, yeah less spa space is more easier because you only build things that you need when you have a lot of space you think oh what can I do with this but at least when you have only a little bit you're like okay these are the only things that I need and we'll build I think, oh, geez, sorry. Um, I think they're both quite difficult in their very different ways in terms of how we contextualise space because there's a very long, deep history in Australia, but the utilisation of space throughout that period has been completely different. Um, and saying that in terms of more traditional infrastructure and I suppose the, the heritage reuse and the adaptation over here, I think coming from an Australian perspective, it seems more, I don't know, fine grain, nuanced and rich because there's so much history already in a built infrastructure when you go to revitalize that. So like going to all of these industrial re reuse places, I'm kind of just walking around in awe being like this thing's 400 years old. Whereas we just don't get that in Australia um, unless it's, we, we do, but in a different, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think as an extension of that, um, our approach to living is becoming kind of uh, the model is worsening over time, especially as the, we continue to expand in Melbourne um, and the kind of 
concept of urban sprawl that is uh, sort of remedied by some of the, the typologies of uh, Italy in that we really rarely uh, have a reliance on um, apartments and that kind of thing and building upwards, building vertical. We like everyone wants their own house. And I mean, it's the same in Italy to some degree uh, and different in other parts of Europe. But I think there's a lot that we can kind of learn from each other in terms of the, the, the typology of the spaces. I don't think it's about one being more successful than the other. Um, just going back to what Ron was talking about as well, with the, I guess, the rich industrial history of Prato, I think that was um, really interesting to sort of dissect through the supply chain analysis and models. Um, like when you went to the textile museum, they said, you know, almost everyone knows someone or is working in the industry. So it's a very rich and ingrained in this place. And it was very interesting to sort of understand the different types of supply, but how they can all kind of help each other and what we can learn from them um, might be a new way to sort of repurpose industrial space for Prato. I'll just say one last quick, how much time do we have? I don't want to, I was just going to maybe pose a question if maybe you, any of you might want to answer the same question because I find whether it's a larger space or a smaller space, the difficulty to maybe reuse or repurpose is actually easily as difficult because when you have such a large space, even if you take out the fine grain history of it, you've got all this space, but you don't want to overcrowd a space. You still want to appreciate at a large scale. But then when you're at this more fine grain, small industrial warehouse, which we've seen a lot, especially through Macrolotto Zero, what these guys explored through their video, it's about sort of limiting and restraint so that you don't actually destroy what little like historical value or just overall value of the built fabric is left. So maybe I'd be quite interested to see what your guys' opinions are. Maybe actually, if you've been practiced and realized these different scenarios, what's easier or if they are easily as difficult or on the same plane. I, I say just one thing. I, I'm not sure it's a matter of a big or small space, I think is a matter of density because um, you can, uh, big space, small space, give you different possibilities to do different things. But what we need in order to make a space alive and meaningful for the, the people living there is the critical mass of uses. And so it's a, a, a relationship between a space and um, people living there. So I think it's a, it's a matter more of density of different kind, density of, yeah. Just some comments because I found out uh, very interesting, especially the statement about and the question about that you posed about uh, the necessity to remake productive some spaces. And this is, I guess, it is a key question because sometimes uh, some uh, um, refurbishment, refurbishment uh, operation risk to be strongly affected by rent uh, mechanism and uh, uh, reasons. So uh, the, the attempt that in Prato, for instance, uh, is going on uh, about the recovery of the Macrolotto Zero is to create new public space to uh, um, uh, create a relationship with local inhabitants. Uh, but there we have another problem, further problem related to the multi-ethnicity of this space, because, and in this sense, uh, public space could be uh, support uh, uh, the opportunity to exchange between different communities. It is not easy eh? at all because uh, uh, the cultural values and the habits uh, between uh, Chinese uh, and uh, Italian are not uh, are very different. Uh, so in the year we experimented this this problem. Another 
uh, issues that, that uh, I reflected on, uh, starting from uh, your uh, presentation, but also by the colleague this morning, is uh, related to the um, to the uh, question uh, of how much this kind of, uh, of operation um, related to search for the creation of a stronger and stable relationship with the place in order to provide uh, and create new economies. Uh, Jane Jacobs, uh, many years ago, uh, sustained how a city region is uh, as such because it created uh, an import replacing mechanism. That means a city is able to produce, uh, to exchange with the the uh, with the, the other cities without uh, not so much uh, uh, um, influences or uh, exogenous conditions. And uh, I ask, I was wondering how much this uh, regeneration operation are able to uh, make stronger the roots with uh, and create local economies. Obviously, it's not closed, open but uh, let's say self self uh, relied self uh, um, supported by the local society and in prato it is not easy uh, maybe you know another experience plus of, and uh, let's me uh, say about that there is a, an experience related to the recovery on an old not so much old building uh, in the north uh, part of prato not to, quite close to the uh, Gorone and uh, Fabricone. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, um, it was uh, subjected to the uh, refurbishment operation for a um, company from Prato. And uh, it is a mixed space uh, for uh, events, for selling, for production, and for exhibition. It is called Mono B. And if you don't know, I suggest uh, you to, to go there, to get there, and also, if possible, to interview the, the, the entrepreneur because it's very um, long, long, uh, long winding uh, person. And I guess it, it is very interesting for you. The next final panel is. Um going to be introduced by Alex and chaired by Alex and so really we're coming to the sort of close of the day we've got three speakers and I'm going to let him introduce them but perhaps the conversation um, we can join Alex in the final conversation and make it a little bit of a final discussion um, where we open up on some of the things that have been touched on um, so thank you Alex <laughs> thank you Mel and um, everyone for inviting me to introduce this session First of all, I was quite blown away by those films. Um, so well done. <laughs> I think they were really great pieces of work. Um, and you've obviously been very industrious over the last 24 hours, um, which is obviously inspired by the productivity of the context that you're talking about. OK, so panel three, meanwhile uses co-creation and public value. So this is focusing on the question of mainstream top-down approaches to post-industrial renewal often fail to engage audiences on the ground and in the process do not generate a genuine public value. So this session will hear from transdisciplinary practitioners who work with soft infrastructures of urban transformation. These include co-creation, service design and social innovation and take a radical approach to change from the bottom up. So I'm very happy to introduce our three speakers. First of all, Dario Marmo, who's an associate and project manager at LAMA, which is a social enterprise established in 2007 and founders of Impact Hub Forense and Made in Manufactura, which manages the temporary use of spaces um, at the Manufactura Tobaki in Florence. Secondly, we'll have Anna Caterina Piraz, who is an architect, landscape architect, and a cartographer, and has been the culture, sorry, the curator of resilience, the art and landscape section of the Italian pavilion at the last Architecture Biennale, the 17th Architecture Biennale in Venice. Um, Anna Caterina is founder and scientific coordinator of LW Circus, the Italian stroke Mexican operative program in between Florence, Asihara Island, Sardinia, and Merida and Yucatan based on social practices. 
And our third speaker is Stephanie Sherman, design director, strategist, writer, and producer working across urbanism, technology, and culture, reprogramming outmoded systems as collaborative platforms. Stephanie, amongst many other things, is currently course leader of our MA Narrative Environments at Central St. Martins in UAL and is founder of Radio, Radio Espacio Estacion or Radio EE.net, which some of you have heard about before. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dario to the lectern. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, well Thank you for inviting me here. And uh, thanks also for everything I've heard the, today, because basically you, you touched uh, more or less uh, uh, all the things I would have loved to say, okay, which is great. I mean, I will try to just put everything in a row now, because you, you, you talked about uh, temporary uses, uh, about Manifattura Tabacchi, you know, and, and the history uh, of Manifattura Tabacchi. So, Let's say uh, I'm, I'm here representing uh, two different experiences. One is uh, the activation of uh, Manifattura Tabacchi. Well, most of you already know and visited uh, there, so I, I won't uh, repeat that much, uh, hopefully. Uh, and the other one is the T-Factor project uh, that also Diana was mentioning uh, this morning uh, that somehow tries to systematize uh, that approach experience method, let's say, across Europe. Um, so, well, uh, just a few words on Manifattura Tabacchi. It was a former tobacco industry, okay? It was uh, giving work to 4,500 people in the 60s and 70s, so after Sant'Orsola, let's say, after the Sant'Orsola period. Uh, and uh, uh, for 20 years, it has been closed, uh, completely closed, almost 20 years, to, to the Florentine population. Then uh, in 2016, a public-private partnership uh, started, okay, with Armand Capital and the Cassa Depositi and Prestiti, that is, uh, well, the Italian state, basically. Uh, and uh, we were asked to activate uh, the space before uh, the space uh, uh, was really, let's say, <laughs> Re repurposed uh, fully. Okay, so this is just a short story of what happened. Here you uh, read 2018 20, uh, 21, uh, because basically that's a presentation of yeah six months ago. Sorry for that. But it's just to say that, uh, uh, let's say, we are at the end of this uh, temporary uses program that lasted four years. So in fact, 2022 is not here because it's a transition moment, as I will try to explain. And um, let's say that uh, we learned a lot from this experience uh, and somehow also trying to answer to your question uh, you, you were asking before. No? So how we put together the top-down approach to the bottom-up. Well, my answer to that, I, I wanted to answer, but then I waited since I had the space here to answer, is it's all about enabling conditions. Okay, so to me, that's, that's my opinion. So let's say, the top down, let's say government or even developers might uh, uh, somehow create, give some space, some platforms for different organizations and even citizens, even not very organized citizens to participate and join, okay? While the bottom up somehow really leads the way to what is possible, okay? So bottom up, it's all about uh, trying to do things uh, that you don't know if they are fully allowed or fully recognized or fully even known as practices, okay? And then somehow these are taken and re-elaborated by the top down, let's say, and uh, in some cases even normalized, okay? I don't want to say it's everything, it's good, okay? But see, still, it's a dynamic process we are living. And um, as uh, uh, I'm not an architect, okay? But I, uh, I feel very much what Professor Alberti also was saying before, like we are persons in between, architects or even social practitioners like me. So what we try to do somehow is to, yeah, open these channels for conversation and trying to empower as much as possible the enabling condition that are there around. So yeah, of course, there is not one size fit all solution, but I think that's a tendency I can observe from my experience. So, uh, well, 
this is Manifatturata Bacchi, uh, once abandoned. Okay, so you see uh, the photos. This is not that different because in the end, uh, the space hasn't changed that much. And even the uh, yeah, regeneration project tried to keep spaces as they were, just renovating them and of course, refunctionalizing them. And uh, let's say we, we try the, the objective we had from, from the developer was how this can become a contemporary hub which in Florence, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something important because as sounds, Florence, even if it's quite near, it's quite different from Prato, okay? Meaning Prato has strong industrial history while uh, yeah, in Florence uh, is another history, even if we had industries before. Um, and the idea was how we can create something that is out of the city center, that is related to contemporary culture, that enables contemporary culture, and that can be recognized as such. So that was the challenge. Um, so let's say, well, mm, well first of all, uh, yeah, the story so far uh, is somehow synthesizes maybe th this, these two uh, statements, okay? Well, the one of uh, Ezio Manzini uh, is quite famous, okay? So it's somehow about the relation between spaces uh, uh, and places, okay? So places have all that somehow cultural recognition and also feeling of uh, being part of a space, okay? So it's not just, uh, I will say that um, places is not just spaces plus functions, that that would, wouldn't be enough. It's places plus functions plus stories plus history. And stories and histories are not the same thing. Because history is what is recognized, stories is something that relates to the individual, and it's where art can help. I don't know, I try to retake back something that also has been said about the role of art before. So uh, you see here, uh, these are some functions that have been activated. The, the, there, up there, you see this is the wall area, okay, it's 100,000 square meters. And of course, it's still under reconstruction, let's say. But the first part that was already renovated has been activated even during the renovation, trying to open the public spaces to the citizens and trying to have ground floor that were already hosting some activities that were permeable, let's say. So that were, yes, private, but then open also to uh, citizens and yeah, users, uh, let's say, of the space. So. I won't list them all, but let's say here you can see that there are many public functions like the playground, the skateboard park, uh, a small park you, you also have visited uh, and that hosts many festivals and events. And while uh, uh, inside the building uh, already some makers uh, or even, yeah, I would say, um, cultural workers are hosted, uh, have been hosted in the last two or three years. Uh, the idea is that these are prototypes that then become permanent at the end of the regeneration uh, period, which doesn't mean everything we say, of course, because it's a trial and error, let's say, or even an adaptation, I would say, process, but somehow that's uh, yeah, the attempt we are doing, not to try to test as many things as possible to understand what really makes sense for the place. And it's not us deciding neither the developer, even if, of course, the developer has its own, his, their own say on this, but it's more about the users themselves, okay? So that, that decide to stay there with a the function or no, the function is not working, let's move somewhere else. Oh, so yeah, how this happened, okay? So first of all, I, I would like to say we started uh, with very light activities, okay? With activities that try somehow to attract uh, citizens, but even already existing associations, uh, cultural organization, companies uh, of Florence, but not only from Florence. And I would say that the importance was not only the mixity of functions, uh, but also the mixture of kind of people and organization participating. So we had some locals and we had on purpose some that were not locals, okay? Because the idea was really, how can I activate a conversation you know, between different organizations that wouldn't be maybe talking if not just because let's say they're neighbors, no? So um, you, you can see this happened a, a lot on festival and a short a short time event uh, basis, okay? So 
one interesting thing is that this festival here, God is Green, for example, um, has, has been based somehow on an initial, uh, let's say, um, yeah, a survey. Uh, it was a postcard survey. In fact, it was not an online survey that we did with citizens around, and that basically were asking for more uh, activities related to sustainability, leaving the yeah green spaces. So somehow the interesting thing is the developer wanted. Yeah, I want this culture based. I want this to host art, to host let's say. Uh, we can say that I would say even high-end okay uh, activities, while citizens say, okay, I, I want to somehow leave more of these open spaces as new squares where I can live differently, my city, okay, and not only being surrounded by cars in an unsustainable manner. So uh, the interesting thing here of God is Green that uh, now is at this fourth edition is that somehow the initial input came from citizens, okay. Um, and then there are other activities like the Grand Tour. So I don't know, maybe, well, since you're or architects, I think you know about the, the concept of wallscapes, no? So of uh, somehow discovering space by moving your body throughout, uh, through histories uh, and stories of, uh, of uh, the neighborhood. So we did something similar with local association. It was by bike, okay? But this also somehow was a first attempt to attract and to uh, raise interest of people. And uh, the initial and the last step of every grand tour was Manifattura Tabacchi, but everything happened outside the space, which is a little, might seem a little bit unlogical if you're place, doing place making. Still, the idea was really to try to weave in Manifattura Tabacchi with the rest of the area. Okay, so um, grand tour was one of the way we tried to do that. Uh, and again, it was not us doing that, okay? We were just uh, uh, coordinating the choreography there. There were many actors doing things together with us. Uh, and then one interesting thing is social district. So lockdown came in 2020. So most of the activities and workshop cannot be done in a live way. So it all happened then online. And this was also the occasion for local small shop to somehow get to know each other and promote themselves online in a period where everything was closed. And that was enabled again by Manifattura Tabaki. So again, this is, a, I will say, virtual example of how temporary is a platform for interaction, even in this case. Oh, then we also had some physical installation related to activities. Okay, so big heaping on the roof or a botanical garden or this experiment that is Fabrica dell'Aria, that is, is an indoor um, air, uh, yeah, let's say air treatment system done by uh, plants that has been experimented by University of Florence uh, uh, professors, and that now is replicated in many different uh, uh, buildings. Okay, so somehow we were, uh, yeah, um, I would say uh, guinea pigs of, of this, uh, but successfully, I guess. Um, and then, of course, art has uh, its own role. So we hosted exhibition, talks, performances, and uh, we founded uh, six artistic residences every six months, okay, for artists under 35 and uh, not necessarily Italians, okay, so like we had a half and half. Uh, and again, here, art. On one side, we can say it was instrumental, which is not a good thing in the way I'm saying, but it's like that, okay. But on the other side, it was also a way to test to what extent uh, the artistic communities might approach such a space that maybe initially was perceived just as, I don't know, like <laughs> something gentrifying or I don't know, somehow repurposing an area in a top-down way, you know? So it was interesting because somehow that, has been a learning process also for us, interacting with many artists. And for them, I think it was also a way to enter into contact with different communities they wouldn't have been in contact with otherwise. So uh, this has been very interesting too. 
And of course, we did this in connection with, with the art networks uh, of, of Florence, okay? So the idea, again, was not only to weave in spaces, uh, but also to weave in rela relations, okay? So in the city center, you have many different art uh, uh, centers. Here in Prato, you have Pecci, okay? We did many also collaboration with Pecci in Prato. So we, we tried really just to add a point uh, on that map uh, and a point that was not... Uh, overlapping with, with the other experiences, but it was somehow enabling new things to happen. Okay, so like the art residencies, okay. So we try to be functional also systemic, at a systemic level, let's say. Oh, and that led us to not a museum, that it's not a museum, uh, meaning that it's somehow, a, let's call it an accelerator and an enabler again of, of artistic productions. And then, of course, uh, yeah, we had many different uh, festivals. Uh, it's, it's nice that the second video shows some uh, pictures uh, from uh, Lucia Festival. That is a radio broadcasting festival. So it, it was all happening uh, in podcast, let's say. Uh, but also somehow we, we had some more self-reflective moments, such as the, God, uh, the uh, Many Possible Cities uh, Festival. There is the uh, festival on urban regeneration we are uh, hosting in Florence, uh, and that somehow is, has now become at its fourth edition. I wouldn't say the, uh, the, the reference point, no, no, nothing like that, but let's say one important uh, moment for practitioners of urban regeneration to meet and talk okay, every year. Um, so you see there that, that this, let's say, uh, steps uh, we already walked. Uh, we started with uh, enlivening the space. Then we started inhabiting the space with the first um, residents, uh, in some cases also tenants, uh, not only temporary tenants, because there is already one building that became a university, Polimoda, okay, that, uh, that is already there in a stable way. Um, and then we worked uh, art and nature, so between the relation of nature in the outside and art being embedded in the, in the two buildings. And then now we are in the last step, so from temporary to permanent. So let's say all the functions that have been tested will move to another building that is now, uh, yeah, almost uh, uh, under, it's almost ready, okay? And so we will, I hope one year from now to tell you how many of the, those functions really have been stabilized. I guess many, not all of them, which is will be a good result in that case. Um, yeah, so these are just some great photos of what happened, okay? Uh, just for you to show. These are some of yeah, the, the workshop we have inside. Also, there were some images that have been shown in the video before, you know, from the hat maker, for example, and the co-working space. And uh, yeah, I think my time is over. So I'm stopping here. Um, maybe just a few words, just give me one minute more. Let's say this experience and the experience of others, okay, somehow try to uh, provide knowledge to T-Factor. So if you want to know more about that, I invite you to go on T-Factor site where you want on not only find uh, this experience, but other advanced cases, let's say like King's Cross uh, in London, that was a source of inspiration for, for us to or uh, La Friche La Belle de Mai uh, in Marseille, that somehow is completely different, even if it's a tobacco factory, because it's fully bottom-up and state-led somehow in terms of financing. Um, so there's a word. We, we, we don't have the recipe for temporary uses uh, traction and prototyping, okay? We are just one experience. Uh, and uh, yeah, we want to continue somehow knowing also from other experience. That's why we are collaborating in the T-Factor project. Oh, yeah, that's it. I, I can say so many things. I, I wouldn't do that. I leave just some numbers uh, from, from the first two years. Uh, okay. Uh, so just double that if you want to know how it's going, more or less. And uh, thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. That looks amazing. Hopefully next time we're in town, we can come and visit. It's much cooler than King's Cross, by the way.
Okay, next up we welcome Anna Katerina Pires. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks so much to invite me here. It's a big pleasure for me. Uh, I am Anna Katerina Piras. I am architect, landscape architect and cartographer. And I'm going to share uh, with you my community method. I am a founder and director of uh, an NGO that is LW Circus. We are based in between Florence, Sardinia and Yucatan in Merida. And we, have, we are an international uh, community of uh, uh, different figure of practitioner like uh, um, architect, of course, artist, uh, landscape architect, anthropologist, geologist, and uh, film director and musicians. And we uh, collaborate strongly with uh, um, uh, minorities. And normally, the idea is to use the uh, medium of art to create a sense of community, a sense of uh, uh, places, to create places. We, we heard a lot about places in, in the last slide. Thanks so, so much to Dario. So this is, uh, we are an itinerant group. Uh, that's why we are a circus. So because we moved and our idea is like uh, that our formula uh, doesn't matter if we are in Florence or we are in Yucatan or we are in Sardinia or in Shishinan in China where we collaborate normally every year, part the last two years with the Tourinscape Academy in Shishinan in the center of, uh, of China, rural China, or in Archipelago of La Maddalena in the natural park. What we do is like uh, um, a universal formula because we work making together. Uh, we, 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 we design through making together. It doesn't matter if we are working with the humans, so local population, yeah, we are in Mani, that is a little village in, in, in Yucatan or with the modern humans like we have done in, uh, in uh, here in uh, Shishinan uh, with the bamboo uh, uh, creating this uh, living uh, cultural shelter or for example in Azinara uh, natural park. So this is a little uh, just to contextualize. So Florence and Sardinian and, and Yucatan in 2000 and plus in 2020, First, last year, but this was in reality the, 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 the year before, we have been invited at Venice Biennale to show our uh, methodology. And this is uh, one of our installations we have done in Asinara National Park. And uh, Alessandro Melisi invited us. Uh, and the question was, uh, how we live together from Sarkis Ashim, that it was a question before the pandemic prize. So it was fantastic, you know, and somehow it seems to be here as a the ball, no? And uh, so we made, uh, um, I've been called to curate the, the, the um, um, sorry, the section of resilience, landscape and art inside the Italian pavilion. We have done a catalog that is available if you want. <laughs> anyway, so we made a catalog and, and this catalog is an anthology because we call colleagues from over the globe that use this mm, different kind of methodology in redesigning places. Then I asked uh, <laughs> to our master, Leonardo da Vinci, I like to show to you the 8P, the paesaggio, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really important uh, drawing. It's really little, but it's really fundamental for uh, you know, the modern uh, um, conception of a landscape. So I, I, I like, I open the catalog with this wonderful uh, drawing. And um, because for me, it's a way to explain our methodology in the sense that this is important because it's showing that Leonardo was only 23 years old when he made these wonderful drawings, but he immediately understood that the human being was part of the system. So he was used to make, you know, the, um, I says vivisection, but it's not the same, it's not the same thing, but the, um, you know, anatomopathology. So it was uh, analyzing the, the blows on the veins of the human being that were the same things of the river. So he made the parallelism in this sense. So this is for the systemic approach. And this is Leon van Skyck, another Leonardus, my Leonardus. I'm really close to him. And this is a wonderful ideogram that is explaining uh, the cosmogony inside which we are moving and what we are trying to do. 
So this is what we have done at Venice Biennale. What we have done is to import uh, a system of living elements, a wall of uh, 22 uh, square meters made by endemism from Asinara Island that was able to absorb one ton of CO2 emission in six months of Venice Biennale. And at the soil, you have Posidonia Oceanica, the dried part of the plant that is fundamental for the oxygenation of the sea. Why? We are, we are I mean, I am, I am first architect and then landscape architect, but when they invite me uh, in 2020, and then after the pandemic, I strongly wanted to bring landscape inside the Venice Biennale to try to sensibilize our colleague of the importance of the environment. Hmm? Uh, so um, this is what we have done. I want to uh, to show to you a little bit about Azinara Island. Not all uh, the world know where Azinara is. It's in Sardinia Island. Uh, Azinara is a national park, but before that it was a national park, it was a sanitary colony and then um, a prison like Alcatraz. And there are a lot of uh, abandoned heritage, like buildings with different, not, you know, an industry, but buildings that they were there to prisons uh, and they are waiting to be reconverted in another uh, future, in other possibilities. It's, it's an amazing place where we have this uh, Centaureo Orrida, that is, uh, is called for Fiordaliso Spinoso in vulgar, but it is a paleo endemism. It's, it's really important because it's like a monument. This uh, plant was able to survive millions of years when the Mediterranean was risking to disappear for the evaporation. So this is really resilient uh, and has this uh, strong capacity of being resilient and, and survive. Uh, that is something that we are going somehow to afford or meet if we want to stay again in our planet. And of course, this is uh, something really different speaking about Prato or thinking about what we are uh, nowadays. Uh, but uh, I thought that uh, um, looking at the, that we are going to meet uh, the summer, it could be uh, really interesting to see the video. Uh, I'm showing to you this because uh, what we try to do when uh, Alessandro uh, through, I mean, uh, or Sarkis through Alessandro asked to us uh, how we live together, we thought, uh, to, to broad the example of Asinara, because for me, the example of Asinara was uh, an example of uh, a beautiful equilibrium in between the relationship, uh, the future relationship that uh, we could have the human beings uh, and the more than humans, in the sense that we have to be probably uh, more respectful and enter like a guest, because it, this is, of course, is a national park nowadays, but there was a, a history of suffering, oppression against the nature, etc. And now, has like human beings, we are guests inside this system. So I thought that it could be probably an extreme example, but th something that can let us thinking about more the approach that we should have in uh, restoring, reusing, or like uh, this, I always says that we have this horror vacui sensation. It's not necessary to build, uh, you know, <laughs> in this sense. Okay. La Posidonia è importante perché è un po' la foresta del mare, quindi eh, magari siamo più eh, abituati a capire l'importanza di una foresta, ma le praterie sommerse svolgono lo, la stessa funzione, quindi una funzione legata prima di tutto all'ossigenazione delle, delle acque. Allo stesso tempo l'organicazione della CO2 quindi ha un ruolo importante anche nell'effetto serra di tutto il pianeta con lo stoccaggio proprio di carbonio nelle sue strutture vegetative. E poi la Posidonia che vive in ambienti sabbiosi ha questa grande funzione di trasformare dei fondali incoerenti quindi difficilmente colonizzabili dalla maggior parte degli organismi del mare in, eh, invece eh, delle strutture eh, semirigide o rigide con la parte rizomale, con le radici, 
ci innescano tutte le catene alimentari che poi portano alla, alla, all'aumento della biodiversità del nostro mare. Ed è un simbolo anche per le popolazioni resilienti perché in realtà la storia biologica della Posidonia è una storia molto particolare perché circa 5 milioni di anni fa il Mediterraneo aveva subito una forte evaporazione, quindi praticamente era quasi scomparso e invece questa pianta, a differenza di tantissimi altri organismi che si sono estinti, è riuscita a sopravvivere, persistere quindi nel, nel nostro mare e diventare la la specie simbolo, anche il nome eh, Posidonia ovviamente dal dio del mare, oceanica perché eh, ha una distribuzione eh, importante su tutto il Mediterraneo, in realtà non è presente nell'Oceano Atlantico, quindi è un nome che racconta più che altro la sua ampia eh, distribuzione in ambito, in ambito mediterraneo. Asinara e una realtà eh, che è sempre stata caratterizzata da questo equilibrio molto sottile tra la presenza antropica e l'ambiente. E soprattutto è stata in passato, prima ancora che colonia penale, è stata un lazzaretto, una colonia sanitaria. Ci sembrava particolarmente adatto andare a sperimentare e portare questo esempio di eh, equilibrio che è storico che va avanti da tanti anni, stiamo parlando di secoli, all'interno dell'isola dell'Asinara, eh, quale esempio plausibile, possibilità di condivisione, partecipazione tra l'essere umano, quindi una questione antropica che comunque è sempre presente, per quanto possa essere lieve, e poi la realtà che ci circonda, gli humans e i more than humans. Rocchita panastri tu e tu mandava, tanto si strano de ogni manera. riconosciamo ancora tutte quelle presenze biologiche, tutti quegli endemismi che raccontano eh, episodi molto importanti anche della vita geologica di questo, di questo territorio e più in generale del territorio della Sardegna, del blocco Sardo Corso e che eh, qua sono ancora presenti e appunto sono in grado di descrivere eh, questi fenomeni così importanti che magari sono capitati 30 milioni di anni fa, 40 milioni di anni fa ma che ancora oggi raccontano con questi palio endemismi eh, molto antichi come ad esempio la centaurea orbita, giusto per fare un esempio, eh, raccontano eventi che veramente provengono dal, eh, dal passato. Siamo partiti in questo luogo magico, in piena pandemia, con la Sardegna in zona rossa, ovviamente tutto programmato da tempo, la nostra comunità creativa resiliente ha convogliato da più punti del globo e siamo arrivati sull'isola della Zinara, dove abbiamo con la, eh, gli operatori del parco, la comunità resiliente eh, dal punto di vista antropico dell'isola, realizzato delle installazioni effimere, questi dispositivi per capire come la comunità locale vede, intende e si relaziona con il proprio ambiente e il proprio paesaggio. comunità resiliente e guida, una volta che arriva in un luogo, quasi per un processo osmotico, respirando, si dilatta, si fonde con quello che trova, sia per quanto riguarda appunto gli elementi antropici e quelli non antropici, e interagisce. Entra in simbiosi iniziando un processo di progettazione che è partecipato dall'inizio alla fine.
quello che conta è il processo e la metodologia attraverso la quale noi arriviamo a installare questo rapporto dialogico con i locali per poi arrivare a produrre il risultato che in realtà vuole cambiare la percezione dell'alterità. Il progetto che non è mai preconfezionato, c'è sempre un'idea ma che viene definita in cantiere in loco, si compie facendolo. E questo processo di brainstorming, di condivisione, di conoscenza del luogo, alla fine fa sì che in un veramente eh, breve periodo, ma di conoscenza molto intensa, alla fine quello che per noi è l'altro diventa parte di noi. Quindi il fare delle cose insieme, il progettare insieme, il realizzare delle cose insieme, quindi condividere nel bene e nel male delle tempistiche, Uh, delle necessità anche logistiche di soluzionare, come dicono gli spagnoli, o trovare una soluzione in cantiere, nel campo, aiuta molto a uh, legare le persone che partecipano a questo processo di progettazione e cambiare completamente la visione uh, dell'alterità dell'altro, che diventa poi qualcuno col quale tu hai condiviso un progetto, e quindi con il quale tu condividi qualcosa che uh, ti lega per sempre, o se non per sempre, per molto tempo. Via. soluzione al problema attraverso un brainstorming di conoscenze diverse, di background diverse, eh, know-how appunto diverso, è fondamentale, cioè questa multidisciplinarità, multiculturalità che ci contraddistingue è fondamentale per noi, per me, secondo me oggi per gestire la complessità dei nostri paesaggi culturali come degli strumenti nelle mani delle comunità con le quali noi interagiamo. Complementarietà e complicità sono fondamentali poi per la riuscita dell'installazione. Quindi quando noi siamo arrivati al parco della Dinara, loro ci hanno accolto e ci hanno messo nelle condizioni di realizzare quello che noi volevamo fare con loro, quindi hanno giocato con noi e si sono tuffati all'interno della sperimentazione. Loro sono stati comunque fondamentali, cioè c'è stato questo rapporto simbiotico tra noi e loro ed è quella che noi proponiamo come la formula, la ricetta per una visione della pratica professionale e della disciplina dell'architettura per i nostri paesaggi contemporanei. Io penso che l'architettura contemporanea non possa più trattare solamente di argomenti meramente architettonici, ma debba necessariamente tuffarsi all'interno di mondi quali sono l'ambiente, l'architettura del paesaggio, l'ecologia, tutte queste tematiche che sono parti fondanti della disciplina architettonica. <susurra>
the more the human survives the Venus Biennale. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was mesmerizing. Very, very, very beautiful. Um, and last but not least, we have Stephanie Sherman. Thanks, everybody. It's been so great to actually be here with you in real life and um, for seeing your videos, which really took magn magnificent sound shapes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that I didn't talk about with the students on Saturday and then make a really quick bridge between radio and show how a little bit how it connects with other projects. Um, so these are all the things that I do, and depending on the circumstance, I might use various combinations of these words to describe my practice. Um, and I have a background in literature and philosophy and have been involved with a number of design projects, both involved with the built environment and urbanism, but also thinking about technology, geopolitics, strategy, the future of work, et cetera. And I really think about all of these different design worlds coming together, social design, systems design, speculative design, and design strategy as different approaches that I bring to any project I do. So as Alex mentioned, I run the MA Narrative Environments program at Central St. Martins, and um, it's, a, it's a course about spatial sp storytelling, and it's really dr rooted in some ways in this legacy of um, speculative architecture, and the way that architecture is always propositional in some ways, but what are more expanded propositions that it might draw or propose in the world. Um, everything from kind of impossible spaces to more pragmatic spaces that think about fun, play, sociality, different ways of bringing and reorganizing the world into forms that might be more deeply rational than the ones that we have. More recently, I'm also bringing a element of technology to this, thinking about how technologies are changing the worlds that we have um, and how they're changing humans in turn. So I'm gonna talk about three projects today, Elsewhere, RadioEE.net, and Auto. And starting with Elsewhere, this is a project that I started right after graduating college with no idea what I was doing. Um, and I went to school in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and found myself moving to Greensboro, North Carolina, which was like an abandoned city with tumbleweeds. We used to play tennis on the street. Um, this is Sylvia Gray. She ran a store in downtown Greensboro from 1939 to 1997. And it started as army surplus. And then she um, collected almost everything you can imagine from the surplus of different industries around town, fabric, and then clothes, and then toys, and then books. And literally, we played a game like try to name something we don't have. Um, her grandson and I, she passed away in 1997 and her grandson, who I had gone to school with and was really interested in ideas of collaborative fiction and collective storytelling, decided to move into the store and declare nothing for sale because how could we value things that were, it would be like our whole lives would be posting on eBay and instead we wanted to use all the things as a context for designing an alternative museum and a different way to think about the, how objects and especially normal everyday objects, but that had all these rooted histories of play and pretend could change the relationships between people and kind of create a context for things that, of course, many inspirations of the found and um, the immersive space informed our work. So we called it Elsewhere and decided that it would be a living museum, artist residency program, and education laboratory. And this meant we started bringing artists and creators and designers from all over the world to come live and work inside the secondhand store with nothing for sale. And at first it was really an archeological project um, and really interesting in, in thinking about the history of mass production, but also how over time diversification emerges out of mass production. So all these phones started as the same phone, but actually their expressions over time became all different and their sounds became all different um, and really wonderful. This is my favorite object in Elsewhere Plan Ahead. It really just says it all about um, how you can <laughs> predict the future. And it was, as much a refurbishment project, um, scraping by to do the things that we could, but then also kind of figuring out how to turn it into a very public space that would invite people in. And that meant things like telling the fire department we were a showroom and telling the police department we were like an education space and you know who knows what the internet company thought. 
Um, but really everything about like touching and playing and interacting and recomposing collective wardrobes, for example, more artistic installations, but every room had to have at least one purpose or function because you can't have a space for just art that doesn't also accommodate people. And we really, what was exciting is inventing things like the art of the workaround. So when we couldn't get a, per a permit for performance in the space, we just turned our front window, in window into a performance theater and put people out onto the street. And that started developing a really active street culture around the block, all sorts of experiments, um, a kitchen, um, community kitchen that had all sorts of codes and protocols attached because it's very difficult to get a bunch of young artists to clean their dishes. And when the public's coming in, that's really stressful. Um, uh, but a garden out back that slowly evolved into a collaboration with maker spaces behind, et cetera. Um, and lots of also public experiences. And again, like we got a grant that was terrible and, and said that we had to kind of put ads out or marketing pieces out. And instead we bought a uh, this bicycle and decided to drive it around town as our spend of the advertising budget because it made more sense than putting out one ad in the paper. So all of these kind of creative ways to figure out how to actually activate and connect with communities. This space is a real space. You can go there on still on a visiting residency. It's been going for 18 years. And over the time we've gone from like tennis in the street to Greensboro is a thriving downtown place where nobody, where now people no longer say like, oh, but where would I park if I came there? So really exciting um, space. And yeah, check it out. Go elsewhere.org, I think. Um, Radioe.net, which many of the students in the room heard about yesterday, but actually started as a project within Elsewhere, where one of our residents, Augustina Woodgate, came back and I befriended her um, as one does when you have many artists coming through and really liked how broken her Spanish was. And we decided to host a radio station in the front window thinking about language learning and online as a space, as an unused space. And there was all this surplus of air and, and sound that nobody was activating. And over time, the radio started to really focus on mobility and movement as its core themes. Um, transportation, migration, climate transformation is the kind of things that it orbited around. And then slowly as we started to get involved in more projects and invited to do more things, it started really taking on this mobility focus. So putting the radio in transit and using that as a way to build engagement, host conversations, do research, but through this really mediated um, realm. And the idea is online nomadic translingual radio. So people speak in whatever language they want. We explore sound, words, conversation, things that don't make sense in one language and do in another. And it's all about this like moving interaction through the city in whatever format is appropriate for the occasion or, or vehicle or device. Um, Now, during the pandemic, this took an online form with a project called Wireless, where instead of us moving, the radio moved to 24 locations all over the world. So then it was about actually figuring out how to make a radio move and how to make a broadcast um, actually connect to all of these different um, locations. And we used the theme of wireless and wireless internet to also start thinking about the technology of internet and radio as a transmission mechanism that would, that's also the way that we communicate with satellites and outer space. And potentially if other beings are communicating with us, then it's likely that's the medium that they're going to use. Now, this practice of sound and radio and using audio as a way to connect with communities, understand space, um, explore the built environment has also been feeding into my thesis, which is going to be defended in December of this year, um, which pivots around the idea of auto. And that means both automobile, automo automation, and automatic in all of the kind of, I mean, there's a million autos we could go on, auto poetic, et cetera, et cetera. But it really came and emerged out of the hellscape of moving to Southern California and being just totally baffled about how in the world this kind of thing happened and how we allowed this space to happen and really just sitting in traffic for an hour every morning in a hot, sweaty car, burning fuel that was killing me, like most perfect weather on the planet year round. And so just saying, how could this, be, how could this work? And I sort of was at the time thinking, well, what if 
what if somebody went back in time and killed Henry Ford? Would we still have the same thing? And that sort of emerged into a counterfactual of thinking about modern modernism and modernization and kind of ideas that we've had about the automobile as both a salvation and a avenue towards freedom in the future. Um, largest traffic jam ever in China, 13 days uh, caused because they were building a bridge to widen the lanes for more traffic. So you see how there's this recursive logic to our um, paradox and really understanding the automobile is this kind of planetary problem, actually, and that even though we have pockets of places like Prato where there's almost everybody scorns when you drive a car down the street, it's absolutely marvelous to just see the faces, the hideousness of this vehicle interrupting the public space that just right on the periphery, then, of course, it opens up and here we have again this violence. Um, and I started, you know, thinking about Henry Ford, not only as a really practical maker, but also as like kind of creating this infrastructural unconscious that is the way that we understand and just naturally process this ecosystem without realizing all of the ways that it's completely colonized our imaginations and our brain. And actually thinking about the model, the model T and this introduction as a precursor to something like the iPhone. Everyone had one, then everyone wanted one, then everyone needed one, and then there you go. And we're and I love my phone, don't get me wrong, and many people love their cars, but it's all about this kind of recursive technological dependency and what the potentials of that and what the pathologies of that are. Now, just to remind you that the, um, the car emerged to solve the horse problem, um, and it's not like the car wasn't dealing with a real issue. I mean, there really was shit all over the street. And so, like, at the time, it was great because it was like, thank you, we don't have to do this anymore. Um, but also there was many alternatives to shared transit. Um, electric cars were invented in the early 1900s as well. So we took a path that led us into all sorts of obligation. Now, when most people think about the Model T, they think about the production line, um, which is um, in its history of Fordism, we all know is um, kind of, all of our critiques of standardization and obligation wrapped up in this and the way that humans were treated as robots. Um, I think that they were just pretending to be robots or playing robots to do the work that robots would ultimately do. Um, but I also looked at Henry Ford in the demand side. And so saying, well, it's not just that the car was millions of cars were built and created and bought over the world, but actually that this was designed and the desire for the car was designed. And so from race cars to tractors traveling down the street to cinema. So Henry Ford had the biggest motion picture company of any industrialist on the planet. So if you went to see a film in 1908, then you saw cars on the screen between every single movie, not advertised, but as product placement. So totally naturalizing the car inside the urban, the urban fabric. It made complete sense that people in rural locations would have cars. In fact, more people had cars than bathtubs. But in the urban space, this, had, this was like a complete redesigned, uh, reappropriated imaginary that was done through culture. And so this bodes very well for art because if Henry Ford could use culture and deploy it towards this, then actually our job as artists or designers or interventionists is actually to reroute using all of the tools of desire and imagination towards other kind of things. And there's also the job of figuring out what those other kinds of things actually are. So many interpretations, look, everybody had their own way of rebuilding the, mo the Model T. Now, we also like to think that there is maybe more change in what we have now than what we have had. So Henry Ford got his idea for the production line from slaughterhouses where they were deconstructing cows. And we're sort of familiar with this idea of work being tracked and moderated, which was kind of the Taylorist notion at the time. But again, the histories of this, whether they're human or robotic, are very much present with us. They just might not be located in one geography or another, but are probably in China, which is going through a very similar development process that different locations went through at different points. But you can see, look, people manufacturing the iPhone, this is not so far at all from the kind of images we have of the assembly line. And we have kind of robotic warehouses that are 
Similarly, these kind of infrastructural zones that are quite interesting in terms of thinking about how the history of things and the history of devices and facilities um, is reshaping the planetary space. And Elon Musk is doing a really great job of imitating Ford. He definitely like follows the playbook and um, is selling us just as Ford did a fantasy of going back into rural space and kind of being able to escape from the horrors that the car created while in fact using that to sell the car, which then ruins the space of the land that is the device that you're supposed to escape into. So it goes on and on. And maybe outer space will be the space that we managed to create. Anyway, um, lots of diagrams of thinking about how auto automaticity and the unconscious relate to one another. Now, tying it back together, turns out that Henry Ford was such a good globalizer, colonizer, that he wanted to make have access for this vertical integration is that you try to get every product underneath the mandate of the Ford. So every single thing could be manufactured and controlled. And this makes sense if you run a production line, because the last thing you want is like having to stop the line because your glass manufacturer cut out or whatever. You want to own everything so you can control exactly when things are coming into the factory and it's all on you so you can calibrate everything which means that you need rubber and you need a lot of rubber. And so Henry Ford said, hey, what we want to do is go to Latin America. We're going to start a rubber plantation. No problem. We're going to call it Forlandia. Perfect. The people will love it. And what we need is we're just going to like set up, set up this plantation according to Ford's principles. And like, you know the story. You've seen Werner Herzog maybe, or it's like reads like a classic of the genre where Big industrial goes in, doesn't talk to the people at all, burns the lands. And you have this kind of brings the prefab housing from Detroit, which then is like full of bugs and it's hot and like destroys all the indigenous knowledge of what the housing design was like before. And what you get is like one of the greatest debacles of whatever the indigenous workers revolt they smash the clocks they burn the, the plantation they retake it he does it again he moves upstream calls it a research station does the project again fails again and eventually it's left to the locals 30 years later pulls out a huge loss of money now we were obviously enchanted by this place, given a history of interest in abandoned spaces and also how people inhabit them. And actually thinking that like actually abandoned spaces as they're described on various websites are never abandoned. They're full of animals and stuff and people who have always been there caring for them or thinking about them. And we found, we met someone who had been there and said, oh, well, my best friends in town ran this radio station. And we said, oh, great. This makes sense because this is a way that we could connect with the logic there. We're not just going to go as like anthropologists and take. We actually want to go and figure out how we could integrate, do something logical and interesting. And, and so she said, we will hang out with the radio station guys. And we finally got the WhatsApp contact of we had friends in Brazil and we got the WhatsApp contact of somebody there. And they told us that the radio station had left. And we said, OK, perfect. Well, we can bring the tools and we'll work to re -end. And they said, we really miss the radio station. It was this way that everybody in the community connected. We said, great, we'll bring, a, we'll bring all the equipment. We'll come down. We'll do a show. We'll co-broadcast with the people that are there, the students in the school, to incubate a new station. We'll co-broadcast as the emergent thing. And that's what we did. And you can see as a translingual radio, of course, we're always excited to kind of find ways to integrate languages or connect languages. So even if you don't read in Portuguese, you can kind of get a gist of what's going on. And we had students take over the radio for four hours, mostly in Portuguese. So they themselves kind of managed, managed the broadcast and explored all different ways of creating sound. Now, the biggest mistake we made, and this is an interesting lesson, is we brought FM radio transmitter broadcasts. We, as an online station, said, oh, what this community needs actually is FM. And it's true that they did need FM, but all the students are on Facebook. 
So like, it's also our own naivete to think that we're going to the Brazil and that we need to bring some outdated technology when also, sure, that is useful, but we also needed to then realize that we need to give these people tools to broadcast all online because all the students are like, learning seven different languages from connecting with people all over the world. And actually that's the exciting thing is that this indigenous community in the Amazon that's like learning and making actually wants to be connected with the whole planet. It's not about kind of being separated or different. And that was a really important lesson and something that we needed to adapt to. Coming back to San Diego for a very quick moment, it's just to say that once you start looking for Ford, you find him everywhere including in Balboa Park, which is the, one of the biggest, I think it's the second biggest public park in the United States after Central Park and is pretty much the best thing about San Diego is that it's got this huge park that hosted World's Fair exhibitions and it's in the center of town. It's really public with all these interesting buildings and museums. Well, it turns out that sitting in the middle of this incredible infrastructure is an abandoned amphitheater that Ford built in the 1930s next to the... Um, the Teague building, and that this incredible theater, am outdoor amphitheater, was just like sitting around there, um, used to host the most incredible sets for installations and film. And so started working with a group and team to think about, okay, how do we reactivate this? And one of the most amazing stories that I can share with you is that the reason the amphitheater closed is because it was under the flight path and it was like super low. And so there was this joke that it was the stop and go theater. And then actually the planes became so frequent that they had this little traffic light that when the plane was coming, then the whole audience would like freeze. And until the plane or the, the people on stage, the performers would freeze until the planes flew over. And all the engineers and, and like cultural production people are like, nobody wants to attend a performance where everything's, everyone stops, but we kept going. But everyone remember the thing everyone remembers if you go anywhere and they remember this place, it's actually that the performance paused and stopped. And this was really enchanting. And so how can you actually work with the fact that like people looking out the window can see you is sitting in the audience and, and work with the pausing as a mode of performance and experimentation? It's an outdoor amphitheater. How amazing. So this is an ongoing project. It's a nonprofit now led by a wonderful guy, Steve Stopper, but like helped to kind of set this infrastructure in motion to just reroute the conversation from engineers imagining putting a bubble over the thing to just embracing what the actual conditions and dynamics were on the ground. And this is about design, actually, and the way that in some ways the car said that design was about ornament or set that in in motion imaginarily, but actually design ornament is the last step about design and the way we want to think about it. Now, finally, a few thoughts on automation in the future, because that's where a lot of this research and this kind of whole realm of research has taken my thinking. Um, this is from the 1960s, so it's not like the conversations around automation are new either. Um, but I've been starting to think about, and these are some like propositional photos, like even Ford themselves, I found this in the archives of Ford Motors imagining monorails in urban spaces. So clearly we're missing something in the gap. Um, but I look a lot at kind of machine vision and thinking about how cars see and what will happen when, um, when humans no longer drive cars and think about how horrible all the images of these futures are. And that certainly we need a totally new imaginary of what automobile space is because everyone owning a car that's driving around is like the opposite of a rational use of geometric space, no matter who is driving at any point. So this has provided the foundation for amazing design-a-thon works. We hosted one in San Diego around transit. We hosted one at MIT around human-centered transit. And just thinking a lot about how these kinds of images actually also change and augment how we might think about urban space, what it is for a car to see, ur to see urban space or any kind of vehicle to see urban space. So seeing like a car, seeing like a vehicle is definitely something we're thinking about. We're also thinking about this work has also, I work with a think tank on the future of work called Autonomy, and I'll wrap up in just a minute. And um, we started thinking, okay, what could we do? There's people like outsourcing drivers. And so now you can have like a little robot delivery cart that's supposed to deliver your meal in London, but there's actually somebody in Brazil sitting there in their home with a video game, 
navigating this thing and they've got like four different ones because they don't need to drive just one driver. It's like fine on the street, but when it hits a curve, then the human steps in and kind of like helps the robot out. Well, what do we do in given Brexit in Europe that there's actually, as cars come in, how are we gonna support jobs, support workers, support drivers? And we came up with the idea of an AI. This is this is someone. I mean, it's not only for like robots. It's also for race racing. So like they're now picking race car drivers out of the best gamers, then become real race car drivers. It's real. The virtual is making the real space. Anyway, what we said is, well, I think the best leverage point would to be would be to make a driver's license for cars. So AI driver's license. It's just an identity, it's an identity thing, and then played that out as a speculative game. What kind what could we do if we had a policy that said every piece of automation that's navigating the streets also needs a driver's license? Well, if you have a driver's license, then you can tax it, you can track it, you can follow this. So surveillance capitalism on people is terrible, but on automated vehicles is actually fantastic. The last thing we want is them moving on their own. It's actually much better if we can kind of use the policy mechanisms that we have to start leveraging this, because then you can also think about how do we reroute urban space? How do we actually take space away from cars and use this tool to do so? Let's see if I have anything else. There's some amazing glitches that happen when you're playing. So this is all to say, just thinking about things, not only in this like intimate and interactive local, but also how they play out on a planetary scale from protocols to infrastructure, et cetera, is definitely, it, none of these tools are, they're also incredibly site-specific spe site and situated, but then they also can play out on um, really grand scales. And that's the scale in some case that we need to be thinking because the climate change knows boundaries or borders, not in the ways that we have, it doesn't follow 19th century geopolitics. So it's part of the order we need to imagine. William Gibson, what a hero. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Can we invite Dario and uh, Anna Katarina to uh, take a seat at the front as well, please? That's a pretty impossible task to wrap that up and think of like just one or two questions. Um, <laughs> and halfway through, I was completely infused and elated about the future of man and the planet. And now I feel quite scared, Stephanie, as I often do after a presentation by Stephanie Sherman. Um, I'm gonna change things up a bit and ask the students to ask some questions or make some comments. And maybe we could all come a little closer and um, raise some thoughts. I think we've only got about a quarter of an hour left before some of us need to run to the airport, um, which seems quite fitting um, as a way of uh, um, ending with a little um, transport performance. But um, this is kind of all building upon and centered around your work and your workshop. So what are your thoughts or, or questions, possibly about the whole day, not just what we've just seen? Oh, hang on. Where's the um? It's a wonderful question. There's an organ, sorry. Thanks for that. It's a great question. We started to ask ourselves the same thing. There's an organization called the International Telecommunications Union, which is run by, run by the UN. And we started doing a lot of work looking at spectrum allocation. And actually this is kind of, it's not, it's potentially infinite, but it's not infinite as an infinite resource because it's regulated by capitalism and the spectrum. And that's because we don't want like, the um, 
the pilots to be overlapping with like F107 FM or whatever. We actually do one spectrum so that people aren't occupying the airwaves at one time. And at the same time, there's an artificial scarcity that's engineered into the spectrum that is historically because big industrialists were allocating and hogging those different spaces. So there is a different planetary project in how do we reallocate that infrastructural resource? If you're interested in these questions, there's a really great architect named Keller Easterling who works out of Yale, who can kind of is responding to a lot of ideas, both about physical urbanism, but also like infrastructure and protocols. And so it's just, a, and she's a really great writer too. So it could be a cool place to look if you're interested in those kind of questions. Yeah, oh, I, I, uh, I, I feel what she's doing is more amazing than what I do. But uh, uh, that being said, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, proximity, uh, being in, living in the same space. Uh, um, if, uh, I, I uh, wait, I restart. I see one parallel that is strong between uh, what she said and what I said is that um, they had a very small um, budget to market uh, the space and they decided not to go on the newspaper, let's say, but to buy uh, a bike, like, okay, bike. and go around physically to meet people, no? And uh, on, on a total different level, okay, we were contacted by this uh, uh, developer, okay, that said, okay, we have a marketing budget, but we don't want to use it by doing just marketing, okay? We want this budget to be used to create something uh, that was temporary activation of space. So that was the physical experience of leaving that space for people, no? So of course, two different approaches, two different scales, but there is this point in, in, in common for sure, no? The, the fact of uh, you can do something that is real, a real relation between people instead of just advertising or trying to sell something, you know, so opening a conversation with the other. And I think that that is somehow powerful. And I also think, I hope that is more the future. Okay, somehow personally, please. Well, but I love what you said. I mean, this is a hijacking, right? Of like literally finding the budget loopholes and being like, wait, let's just re, sure, call it whatever they wanted hear that it's called but actually it makes much more sense to realize this thing in a different way but you said something so profound which is like create the conditions so and you can't only create conditions with exclusively bottom-up things i mean this is like why governance was invented in the beginning because actually like rules are kind of helpful or can be helpful if they're constructed right or a manifesto is actually a wonderful thing because it sets the terms and the conditions on which people can engage and so completely open free-for-all in my experience of living in a collective for 10 years is not like a great way to have a community in fact I find it much more enjoyable when there's mediating structures that can be renegotiated or rethought but it's like that kind of those protocols are really important and useful. Um, so I think this is where we get into the fact that like if we celebrate bottom up so much that we think that everything is only emergence, 
then we get into a trouble because we essentially have like an anarchist, like that's what the car was actually, a totally bottom up infrastructure without a plan to say like, what are we actually gonna do? And you just develop iteratively, iteratively and you don't actually say, wait a second, like what is the whole, what is the, what is the aspiration here? And you end up with something like that. So I think what you're pulling on is something super important that like, as we negotiate these spaces, we, we do wanna be as gently top down as well as bottom up as we can just to put enough structure in space so that those ecologies can thrive really well. And that like invade, we embracing the kind of the non-native species as well is part of part of that um, protocol. I don't know if there's anything in here to this. No, I was thinking question. about what you were saying that uh, there is an example in Rome, the, the is man, the museum of the others is called in Italian is il museo dell'altro dell'altrove that was like an ex farm I don't remember of what of uh, sausages probably and uh, it was spotted by people and uh, and uh, uh, they invited uh, uh, the ex director of uh, macro what's the name of our colleagues uh, uh, I will okay and anyway there is uh, the ex-director of Macro <laughs> that invite artists in this place uh, um, to reinterpret this place. And I have to say with zero budget. So it's, it's quite uh, different, you know, the, the operation in your sense, because for example, uh, not to be um, polemic, but for example, the thing that uh, Mancuso has done, La Fabrica dell'Aria is something really expensive. It's something that you need a lot of money to do a thing like that. So it's not necessary. I mean, the people, the people are like plants. They are pioneering and they go on the, on the places and, and, and they, are able to recreate places, only people. We are not able, we, are, we have not the magic stick. We can do the most beautiful uh, places in the world, like for example, uh, the outside place in Macro, in Maxi, sorry. Every summer there is a competition, etc. They put the money. Yeah, some people go there, but for example, MAN for me is a small uh, successful project. So I, I believe that is not always necessary. We have to stop and think that we have to put a lot of money to make the things uh, because uh, the problem is that uh, the, the, the system of production is a failure. We are killing ourselves, our cities are burning. And where we are going to live? I mean, uh, the guy that uh, made the te Tesla, what's the name of the guy? Tesla, yes, Elon Musk. They are projecting to go to live uh, on Mars because they have the money. We are going to be, to die, you know? We are suiciding ourselves. So it's not necessary, we have to stop to produce stuff in our planet, we have no more space to, to, to to, 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 to put more on the system because the system is, is collapsing. I don't know if you know that yesterday was the problem of uh, the slope uh, on the mountain. Uh, it, it was the marmolada. Marmolada was like, I don't know how many tons of ices and rocks that slope for the climate change and people died. I mean, so I think that we have really to reconsider the way of, acting and stop to think in this system of car, as you were saying, etc. that uh, there is no point. We have to find a way to change the paradigm. So, and, and adapting the, the coronavirus. In, uh, I think that we have to learn from coronavirus, how to adapt ourselves to survive. And this is what's really um, you know, instructive for us last year that we had to produce something for Venice Biennale, but was all in lockdown. We moved even if we were in lockdown, you know, and, and, and this is, we say in Italian, navigare a vista. That means that you are looking and you are sailing and you have to be careful because there is not, you are not seeing you know, at the distance. So I think that in our practice, we have to find other tools other mentality change completely, of course, reused, but it's not necessary to think about money, 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 because at the end, we are not, we are not going to inspire money. 
we are going to die any, anyway. This is my <laughs> opinion. Uh, and yeah, can, can, can I just say two things about uh, what you do, okay? Because it, it made me think about two things that I can be, I think can be good references for those who doesn't know that, okay. First, there's uh, uh, an artwork that is beautiful. Uh, it's my favorite artist, and you reminded me a little bit of that. Uh, and it's Andy Goldsworthy, yeah. uh, Rivers and Ties. Oh, I, yeah. I, I thought yeah. you, you knew that. <laughs> and that's beautiful. So search for it, Rivers and Tides, Andy Goldsworthy. That, that's so beautiful, OK? She, she does something like that somehow. And the other thing that I think is very powerful in the work you are doing is um, try to give agency to nature. Because in our system, there's not e enough there, okay? And uh, also another interesting reference I'm looking at is the ZOP, okay? So it's uh, somehow a governance system where nature has its own, um, it's represented somehow by a human, of course, because it's, it's a meeting of humans. And somehow there's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an, some experimentation of governance system that it's, it's very powerful. And so you made me think also about that because somehow in the work in Lazinara, it's not just about humans, okay? You, you told it already, so, and it's, it's very important. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, I, I feel like we're just getting started on our day. So I feel like some sort of horrendous party pooper, but these guys have to go and get a plane and their taxi's like five minutes away. So, um, well, three of them. So I feel like I might have to call it and sort of do a bit of a wrap up, but um, it's the classic condition, a one day symposium, we're just in the warm up. Um, anyway, I think, uh, how can I wrap that day up? I mean, we've come from urban planning um, policy all the way through to this conversation. And it feels like, uh, yeah, just layers and layers of thick description in a way of what the, the actual issue that we've been looking at really is. And I think that's fa fabulous to sort of take, we took a slice through industry, you did this last week, and maybe through dipping into all of these sorts of things, including the final finessing of your great films. Um, I feel like we've sort of started to delve into the true depths of what industry means, production means for society or lack of production or finding new ways of producing. And it's a, it's a much thicker project than, um, a, a sort of than maybe it sometimes seems. So really thanks to this panel for bringing that to, I mean, it was, I thought it was good curation there because we actually planned for this to blow it all up and, um, and you did. So, um, so I think we should probably say that's about the best I can do as a wrap up. Um, We'd just like to say thank you very much to Mel. So we've had a wonderful three days and we feel like the kind of imposters and visitors that ruined the planet by flying in, <laughs> not doing much, listening to some really amazing conversations and then flying out again. But hopefully it's the beginning of yes, more yes. workshops yep. and collaborations, maybe here in Prato, but between UAL and um, uh, Monash. And I'd like to extend our thanks to Leanne and Rutko and all the students and participants and mail for having us. Thank you. And, and, I also, and I also would just like to thank all of the other participants that we gathered along the way, which was quite a rich mix. People from Milan, uh, people from Florence, people from T Factor and Italy. So it feels, I know some of those people have had to go, so we'll send their thanks on, but it's been great. And um, the way that we see this is a sort of first chip at the edge of a collaboration that we might start to make between um, University of the Arts London and Monash happening in Prato, but with all of these other ecosystems that we've started to make. So it's really a, a very elaborate meet and greet is what we've done today. And I hope the students um, got something out of that and it rounded off their, their sort of two weeks and they can now relax. And um, yeah, so thanks to all the participants for their time. It's, it's been given freely and generously, and that's really awesome. Um, and thanks for the CSM crew for coming. Oh, and there's one more thanks. The ceaseless, tireless work of Leanne and Rutger, who are like the linchpins, I have to say, with their sort of, huh? Taxi, 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 yeah. Okay, bye, bye, Alex, Stephanie.
And I think I might say goodbye to people online and stop the meeting.